My name is Jonathan Ward, and this is my road story. We're really custom designing or custom building for clients. We have our standard production models, using the term lightly. The rest are one-offs. So you come to me with what floats your boat, and then if I dig it as well, and I kind of design it and massage it to something that you, the customer, and myself are both going to like, which is kind of pig-headed, <laughs> um, but it's a passion business, so that's just part of the drill. But sure. um, they're very personal. So I don't take offense to that whatsoever, because at the end of the day, anything I make is not for everybody. Sure. And I take pride in that. That's, that's like part of the point. So Jonathan, welcome to Road Stories. I have to admit, I'm not much of a 4x4 guy, but what you guys do at your company, Icon 4x4, always has my attention. Let's get right into it. How did it all start? Well, this all started with a conversation that turned into an argument that eventually became a bet at a uh, USC business class. And uh, we got into a heated debate about supply and demand. I said, well, supply and demand is bullshit. Because <laughs> in these modern days, basically, if you can control the supply, you can communicate and create a demand. And they said, ah, so we went back and forth and back and forth. And at the end, it was a $1,000 bet to drive a trackable market up 30 points. I think I was given a quarter or two quarters to do so. And I always loved Land Cruisers. I've always been a massive travel junkie. And uh, I'm like, all right, it's on, suckers. So I went out and bought every FJ40 worth a dam, basically in the Southwest and just kept went on these fun road trips. And it happened at a time in my life where I had the money and I had the time. So it was a blast, man. Me and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and we'd go on fun road trips to Utah or Colorado or Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Washington, Oregon. And we'd go to all the cool antique stores and pawn shops, and I'd be picking up all the thrifty nickels. Remember those? Yeah. Along the way, yeah, I bought yeah. every FJ worth a damn, brought them back to L.A., didn't restore them yet. I was trying to keep it. I was smarter than trying to keep it simple. Sure. Just service them, detail the hell out of them, represent them better, give them the same respect that people would have given a two wheel drive classic, whatever, Mustang or Mercedes at that time. This was in the 90s. And uh, just brought them back to the market. All I was trying to do is win a bet. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I went back to collect uh, on what they owed me and they wouldn't pay me. It's like, all right. So then shortly thereafter, we were in Africa on vacation and uh, literally over a, a, a dinner conversation, my wife and I realized, well, we, 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 we don't love what we do. Mm -hmm. And myself, at least, I, well, I can't speak for my wife. Yeah, for myself, I watched my father do something that he went into with the utmost passion and, and love for mm -hmm. as an attorney. And then over the years, he realized that what he loved and what he was passionate about, about defending people and honoring the law, had nothing to do with modern law practice. Right. And I watched him be sort of disenchanted by that, you know? Same with thinking that, you know, I'll be a lawyer, everything will be fine. And, you know, my dad worked, my dad just retired in, in his late 70s with no great financial security anyway. So, like, that model's broken, right? Everyone keeps telling all their kids, oh, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer. Uh, guess what? You know, it, it, it's not necessarily a proven path and it ain't going to work. And I was like, well, I want to do something I actually love because otherwise you turn into an ass, you know? <laughs> yeah. You've got to love your home, love your family, and then you spend more time, arguably, at your job. Right. So if you don't love what you do, you're just going to be a bitter prick. It's just a matter of when, you know? Yeah. So um, I think it's an old adage and it's overused, but you know, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. And I don't believe that necessarily because some days suck. Let's face it with 15, right. over 15. Yeah. I think if every day is great, then you have some that. issues. Yeah, exactly. Or you're taking some crazy pill. Right. Um, but no, it, it, it just literally, it organically grew out of that with no SWOT analysis, no intelligent foresight, like 20 grand, three credit cards, a wing and a prayer, and I just went for it. 
we quit our jobs and we just started doing it. So you've got this bet going on and you start TLC first, right? Yeah, TLC first. And that was just Toyota Land Cruisers, sales, service, restoration, and parts. And in fact, for like the first 10, eight or 10 years, if someone wanted a V8, I'd kick them out. <laughs> so, um, you know, over the years, we, we started doing more modifications because I was noticing a trend where people had a deep love for the aesthetic and the utilitarian principles of the trucks, but less and less people had any love for the archaic mechanical interface so, you know drum brakes three on the tree one barrel carbs and all that like eh, if you're like, nah, you know i really like the look but i don't want to be a martyr to it so i um kind of get bored i get bored at tlc but i loved it and it was a successful business and it still is today but we had this weird phone call one day they call me and we have little radios even then it was a pretty big shop and they said, uh, mr toyota for jonathan line two what? Okay. You know, well, we, you know, we had done builds for Toyota dealership owners, and you know, we were kind of in the know. I didn't even know there was a Mr. Toyota. So I'm like, what? All right, whatever. So I beg up the phone, and I'm Googling as I'm on the phone. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, there is a Mr. Toyota. So yeah, well, it was Mr. Toyota, and he, and he, and he made an appointment to come to the tour of the shop. Now, Toyota and Mr. Toyota all the way through the whole system, they could not get their heads around why these crazy Americans <laughs> would go to this weird shop that takes apart, fixes, makes new again old Toyotas. Right. Because culturally, it's you're not allowed to look back. Okay. Right? So in, 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 in Japanese corporate culture, you never, ever, it's, it's bad, bad, bad. Talk about your past successes. It's always about like Toyota's slogan for a while, they're moving forward, <laughs> they mean it. Mm -hmm. So culturally, therefore, in marketing, there was a massive disconnect to understanding how they could leverage their amazing heritage and history to the benefit of the future of the brand. But mm -hmm. they're watching Land Rover kick their ass by promoting their heritage. Right. So they really, I think, were just coming to visit us more as like a trip to the zoo <laughs> to try and understand and find the rhythm to that culture. And then we ended up being asked by them to build first one and then a total of three basically like fully functioning prototypes of what eventually became the FJ Cruiser. Mm -hmm. Granted, by that time, it actually ended up at like two elements of, of my design input actually made it to it. But during that process, I got to sort of peek behind the curtain in the land of Oz, you know, and, and see <laughs> how they ran their business. And I found some of it very exciting, mostly on the manufacturing side, but I found some of it incredibly dysfunctional. No kidding. Toyota dysfunctional. Oh, and Toyota is like the best. Yeah. That's now, why I was, since yeah. then I, I've consulted and worked with a number of OEMs <laughs> each one. I'm like, wow. <laughs> like each one seems oddly more dysfunctional. It's like they run them like an MBA program is the best analogy to me. Okay. So meaning, elaborate on that. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're in product planning, you're in future product development and design. Okay. Now, if you're a good boy, you won't say anything that's novel, forward thinking or disruptive. Sure. You will stay in your cubicle. You will play by the rules. You will be polite to everybody. Then, when you've added absolutely no value in your position there, but you've played by the rules, you will be transferred to another department where you bring nothing unique to the table. It's, it's like, like an MBA program where they, they literally are just sort of everyone sort of stay on their rung, play by the system, and will move you through different aspects of an education, sure. which I could see for like, like they're doing that with Henry Ford. And, and Henry Henry the Third, he's a wonderful guy, super intelligent, young. When I first met Henry, he was selling cars on the showroom floor at a Ford dealership here in the Valley. But it was brilliant. So Ford actually sent him there. And Ford's had him in various posts. And I understand that, right? Because if he is potentially, and this is just my assumption, the future CEO of Ford, Mm -hmm. You want that granular 
experience and expertise to sure. have like served his time and all these events. Because then collectively, he's going to have his own concepts. He's going to see the deficiencies, have great visions for change. But that's very unique. Usually it's just like everyone serves their time and don't disrupt, don't raise your hand. Right. And like, Automotive firms forgot that the, the product is all about design and engineering. Now, design and often engineering is like a veneer. It's like a the designers are more like adding the swoops and the packaging to it. But it's it's all about the shareholders and in, in, in Wall Street, which I mean, don't get me started. I think that's corrupted much of American business and creativity and on and on and on. But at some point, right, us, culturally, forget car companies, all of these companies, you're going to be able to stand up in front of the shareholders every year and say next year we're going to sell 10% more? Yeah. We're going to glean more profit out of it? What it turns into is we're going to whore out the product more and more and more and more and more until the brand value is gone. Right. Or we're going to keep, Telling the shareholders and trying to appease Wall Street every year for this false ladder of growth that, uh, come on, everyone within a significant radius from us today, right now, right here, has pretty much everything they need. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So the targets of the world, fine, yeah, uh, our backpacks are 1995. And last year they were twenty two ninety five. And the year before that they were twenty six. But that nineteen ninety five backpack is such a hoard out bucket of crap that it falls apart in two months. I think there's more value in our culture, in our country, to start to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And I'm honored to be a little part of that, right? Of this what I call the renaissance of craft, where even Oh, you could argue consumers in the most commoditized segments are like the backpack dude at Target is not going to, you know, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. I'm on my, my kid's on his third backpack in one school year because they're crap. <laughs> I'm going to spend a little time. I'm going to research. I'm going to find someone who put their heart and soul into a backpack. Someone who gave a crap all the way down to what kind of thread is it? Why that material? Why does it care? What I consider a considered product. That's something I'm very proud about what I do. It's not for everyone. I'm cool with that. But you point out any silly detail or material or surface coating or content, I'll have a 10-minute geek out reason as to why it's there, <laughs> why it's made out of that. You know, And I think it's wonderful to see people returning to that level of attention span in consumption. Right. And rethinking the mentality of going to the big box store and buying crap. You know, you know what? I'm going to spend 150 on a backpack. Yeah. But I'm going to do it when I understand the maker. I understand the product, the theology, the religion of that product. And when I believe that product's going to outlast 10 of those $19 backpacks. Right. Yeah. It's the disposable economy kind of. It's bullshit. Yeah. It's I mean, at this point. These big car companies, to meet the number they spoke of 10 months earlier, they incentivize the hell out of them, make no money. They sell them to whatever, corporations and rental car companies. They do all these numbers games to make it work. But if you actually study the business model, it's not sustainable. It does not work. Hmm. So I can't complain too much because <laughs> the more the big car companies screw up in my humble opinion the more opportunity they create for the guys like me you know and mm -hmm. it's and it's an honor to for there to be voids right and for there to be consumers that are starting to stop and think and listen and learn enough to dive into the crazy crap they let me build Now, you could have made life easier for yourself by picking a legacy brand, let's say like Jeep or Land Rover, but instead you chose Toyota. Why Toyota? Um, because at that time in my life, I had already been to over 40 countries, and I noticed that the harsher the terrain, the more remote the locale, when it was a life or death, not a style or trend or personal opinion, but your, your vehicle literally could mean the difference between you making it to sunset or not. Right. The cruisers kicked everything's ass. 
I can't count the number of times I've been in the middle of a desert or in a jungle or whatever in these different locales and in a Land Cruiser pulled Land Rovers out of situation. <laughs> and it was that visceral, right? It was that simple. So I never studied it again. I'm not that smart. Like I, I didn't go, okay, what's the best market opportunity? I went for what I felt was underloved mm -hmm. and most worthy of a deeper appreciation. And, you know, I have a love-hate thing with Rovers. I, I love the aesthetic of them. Mm -hmm. The lightweights, the Series 1s, the 2s, you name it. Um, all the way through even to, like, the, the two-door range. But I don't know. It's, like, all British. Even the, the Rolls and the Aston Martins and Austin Healy's and uh, Jensen Healy's and all the crazy cars I've had are restored. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, here comes the hate mail. But the art of the execution... I just don't get it. The quality's not there. And like the earliest Rovers, the beauty in them was their simplicity. Mm -hmm. So when the damn thing broke, it was pretty easy to like spit on it, pee on it, put it back together. Sure. But same with the Land Cruiser. It's just you didn't have to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nearly as and often. And if you did, you probably did something really, right. really you, bad. You're a dumbass and you asked for it right. usually. But no, I, I just never... Um, it's like the Defender dudes are so diehard. Like... You can't debate with them. You can't speak reason to them. Sure. And they're like, it's the best full by full ever. And I'm, like, I'm just like, all right, whatever. I'm glad you love your truck. But <laughs> I get like a Defender 90 or 110, that front three quarter or profile, whatever, the aesthetic of them in, in print, mm -hmm. magical, right? Whoever yeah. did that, hats off to Sir Whoever. Like, really cool. Yeah. But the actual, then the execution, the engineering that the people, the pencil pushers that corralled and limited perhaps the engineers and the material sourcing people and everything else to then take that rendering and actually create a product out of it was so wrought with sacrifice, in my opinion. Like a Defender, the dash is like aisle three Toys are Us, 50% <laughs> off shark toy. The, the body is angle iron steel with aluminum riveted to it. Boat builders, decades ago, knew not to do that. <laughs> it's like an anodic factory. I mean, it, they, they rust themselves from the inside out. But again, then you got the rover guys going, no, it's, you know, the Land Cruisers, they're steel and they rust. My rover's aluminum and it'll never rot. It's rotting from the inside out, and then it's irreparable. Yeah. You can't you just do don't see anything it about it. Right. So I, I just, I never got it. All the way through to the ergonomics. Like, roll the window down. He's got to, like, pull your arm off at the wrist, <laughs> grab your, your left forearm with your right hand, and then actually be able to reach the damn regulator. And, like, right. they're quirky. They're quirky, but, like, some people find that charming. I've always been a vintage car guy who I'm down with quirky aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I am not down with quirky have to work with you, live with you, service you, yeah. adjust you, reach you. Like ergonomic quirky, that just pisses me off. Because sure. that's just lack of intelligent human <laughs> forethought. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've we done a couple. And, um, you know, we this is before I started Blue Laser scanning vehicles when we're doing one-offs. So we just did simple measurements. And we scanned the part. Mm -hmm. But like doing a custom grill, the left front, lower corner versus the left, right, upper, and then the mirror side, none of them were 90 degrees. Hmm. So then literally we're having to hand adjust and re-CNC and 3D print because there's just a complete lack of care and, and precision in the execution. And the Land Cruisers did not have that problem Hell or no. don't have that problem. Yeah, there's so much better built. And look, not to, argue, not to beat up the Brits. Or the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the Italians, man, that's another one. I love them. <laughs> but like any lux any Italian car, like I always wanted a, a five fifty Marinello and I finally bought one. That's one of my favorite cars of all Magic, time. Magic, right? Every fucking time I took that car out, it screwed me in a new way. And it's like <laughs> it was stupid stuff. Like when the side of the road I went through a dip and not a big dip and not quickly, like like very carefully through a dip. The damn petcock on the bottom of the radiator is on the bottom plane of the radiator. And it's like a sixteenth of an inch above the plastic flaring. So it get ripped out of the bottom of the radiator. I was like, well, why wouldn't you guys put that at 90? Well, why wouldn't you put off the side plane? But right. they're so beautiful, you know? Yeah. But but like just in the vintage four by space, like take a 
a Jimmy or a K5, an early Jeep, an early Bronco, an early Rover, and a Land Cruiser. And I've had them all, I've been up the skirts of all of them, right? Mm -hmm. The quality and the execution and the consideration in the Land Cruiser is phenomenal. It's so above and beyond everybody else. Why choose cars? You could have chosen any other industry to go into. Did you have a love for cars before that? Oh, God, yes. So always um, always had a love for design and engineering. Um, sketching, sculpting, carving, um, you name it, since I was little. And um, again, it was kind of self-serving, I guess, because I loved transportation design personally because um, I had the control what the end result would be versus teamwork and other creative industries, right? Where you put your heart and soul into it and when it's done you really had a very minor impact on what it would be. Okay. And that was the experience that that I was having in my career. But also as a, a a craftsman in woodworking, painting, upholstery, you know, and color and design and detail and tactile and all that. Automotive was the most like extroverted combination of all of these skills and appreciations more than skills at that time that I had. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool, right? It's a perfect storm to have one one entity that communicates all those different arts in a, in a very communicable sense that people are drawn to. So I really loved that. And I've been restoring cars as a hobby well before I decided to make a go of it as a business, restoring them and putting them back together. So um, it just was kind of the low-hanging fruit. It was artistically rewarding. I had already been dabbling in it a long time. I was already a major history geek on different automotive aspects. And um, then from my other passion traveling, I had this level of appreciation and, and respect for the Land Cruiser that um, it just seemed like the way to go. And mm -hmm. you know, and keep in mind at that time, nobody was restoring these old Toyota Jeeps. Right. You know, it'd be an $800 paint job, your brother's 305 left over from his El Camino he rolled and some <laughs> Pep Boys chrome wheels like that. Literally very rarely did anyone take it past that. No kidding. So it wasn't brain surgery. I just thought, why not take that platform and honor it with the same level of attention that people were given to whatever, you know, two ADSLs, three fifty sixes, Mustangs, sure. on and on and on. Sure. It was that simple, but no one was doing it. So I always felt like there's there's gonna be a significant number of people that have kind of been looking and lurking and appreciate them, but like, oh yeah, but I don't see any good ones, they're always beat up and there's probably not any support for them and, you know, weren't getting into it. So I just quite simply thought if you, if you brought to the market the finest examples you could find and you present them in a manner better than most people were, mm -hmm. that you could create that market. And I was immediately overwhelmed with how many people did appreciate that. Wow. I mean, at that point, there was like, there was one crook in the Land Cruiser part space in Southern Cal and there was one marvelous uh, man, Marv Spector, him and his wife, Kay, had a place. They still have it. Marv passed away, unfortunately, years ago. But when I was like 15, I was at Marv's counter picking his brain, driving him crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, when I decided to actually make a go of it, I'm like, Marv, I'm going to do this business. Like, is that going to be really uncool? Because you kind of mentored me in the Land Cruiser space and helped me and everything. And he was very kind and gracious. Like, no, like the more, the merrier we need to prove there's this, this subcult in existence and there's resources, sure. and, you know, there's people behind it and just kind of, again, no, no forethought. I was just trying to avoid having a real job <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of kept rolling. And then eventually I got bored with TLC, came up with the idea of icon after the FJ cruiser job, mm -hmm. went back to Toyota, communicated that idea, got, 
Toyota's support. Support meaning like a kind bow and a we won't sue you. I- oh, okay. <laughs> that's some good support. Hey, that's the best kind you're going to get out of an right. OEM these days. Every car builder always talks about the details, but I think that you have a little bit different of an approach. So talk to me about your approach and your attention to detail and what that does for Icon. Well, I think, again, it goes back to, like, I was always into design and details since I was a little, little kid. Meaning, I I came into the automotive space because I was a geek for the stitching mm-hmm. for the woodcraft for the titanium for the machining and versus i think in the automotive world it's generally born out of the automotive world and they like a specific genre of car and they pick a specific genre of build it's pro touring it's pro street it's hot rod it's street rod it's stock whatever right, right. and then they just naturally then have those confines those blinders on and then maybe they'll start reacting to new car design or xbox or whatever and start doing a shit ton of billet trusses and (laughs) stuff all over there that's superfluous so i think both that as as in my early years as a builder being in a utility vehicle space Mm -hmm. and coming into the car space already with an obsessive compulsive love for every detail Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what made the difference. Also, I had no money. I mean, I started the company with nothing. So I was kind of doing everything. And if I didn't know how to do it, I learned it. Right. And I didn't know any better, right? Because I didn't go to Art Center. I, I'm not, a de- you know, uh, I call myself a designer, but it's because it's not illegal to call yourself a designer. <laughs> but like, I, you know, my my heroes were the Raymond Lowy's uh, of the world and, and Norman Belgides and like, all the designers, you know, and this had their own sort of vision. Mm-hmm. So I came into it with no rules and just didn't know any fucking better. So I started geeking out from my way. But like specifically in the Land Cruiser world, once we started Icon, it was like when I did TLC, it seemed to me 99% of the mods people did were just trading evils, right? Okay, you take the six banger out and you put an American V8 in it and now you're blowing up transfer cases. Or now it's overheating. But yeah, you got more power. But now it's heavier or whatever. So I always kind of step back and I'd look at that and go, okay, well, I understand that tradition. And I understand the uh, the idea of evolving. And I'd already done many sort of concourse dead stock cars with all the imperfections of original. Mm-hmm. So I had no patience for that. Like, well, why, why should we put it back together with cork gaskets? When we know they suck and they're going to leak everywhere. Why should we leave wisps of primer on the undercarriage and chalk lines and shit that wasn't thoroughly done when if we're hand building it meticulously, we can do that all perfectly. So I had some fine art training too in like pre-Raphaelite painting and sculpting and stuff. So I I think it's all those perspectives that I brought into automotive and then not buying into the established genres of styles of build Mm -hmm. that um, enabled my lunacy. And then just the fact that people actually let me do it, then further empower me to not make sacrifices and continue to try and try and do that. But look, when I built the first icon, the first FJ 40 icon, by the time I built it, it was already keeping me up at night. I mean, I already had a model <laughs> in my head I could see in perfect detail and literally modify like in, in some mythical, that'd be really cool actually, CAD program in your head. Google, work on that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I already had a, a very clear clarity of where I wanted it to be before I started on executing it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that when I'm speaking to youth and stuff it's it's always a very clear understanding of what the end vision is before you start taking crap apart and modifying stuff like that that clarity right i mean when i built the first one that was all in my head and mm-hmm. i just did it then i went back and added up what it cost one oh shit <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna pay for that you know and that was a big delay not a big delay but that was took some soul searching sure do i do i change my 
ignorance, arrogance, whatever it is, and like conform to what was considered to be the max or the tolerable price points and then make sacrifices in my product to make a profitable good within that range of accepted price. Right. And someone a lot smarter than me that's been very important to me in business said, no, you're an idiot. <laughs> Don't do that because then your heart's not in it and then you're, it's not going to stick, even if just for you. But if you think about the automotive industry and especially in my arena, that is the way it's traditionally done. You know, people are only going to pay 60 grand for an old Bronco. So what am I going to do? I'm going to figure out what corners I can cut to make a shiny Bronco that people will buy for 60 that I can make a living off of. I'm just the idiot who said, no, fuck that. I want to make the best Bronco I can and shit, it's expensive and I hope people buy it. Every car that Icon puts out is damn near flawless, aesthetically and then mechanically. Now, you've got something that you've been working on that doesn't have one of those things, and that's the aesthetic perfection. Now, they're wonderful, don't get me wrong, but they're different. And I'm talking about the derelicts. So tell me about those. Where do they come from? They came from a stupid idea and a personal car that I wanted to build that I had no, again, intelligence to think this could be... Uh, a branded project. I wanted something. Um, my boys at the time were six and uh, 10. Mm -hmm. So surfing, massive skateboard geeks, so all the skate parks, two boisterous girls gone wild Labradors with no training. <laughs> um, and just life, right? So I was like, you know, again, I had done... Plenty concourse builds, mm -hmm. dead stock. Got over that in a hurry. Then I would do concourse builds, rest of modded powertrains, cons way more conservative than the crazy shit we're doing now. But and then that first ding, that first scratch, that first tear, or that happens enough and then you don't drive it, right? You yeah. babysit it. You only drive it when you know where you're going to be parking and you have full control. And I was just over it. Right. The way you drive over. an Italian car. Yeah. I was just <laughs> over it. Like, uh, life's too short for that shit. So I was trying to buy a Land Cruiser. I was out in like Pacoima. And this dude literally like chain link fence, multiple pit bulls, multiple crap cars in the backyard. Land Cruiser was a bucket of poo beyond redemption. And I saw this really cool station wagon he had. And again, I'd owned many two-wheel drive classic cars at this point. Um, I'm like that, that Chrysler is cool. So I got to talking to the guy and I bought it and I was like, okay. So I brought it back. Finally got, it was in a clutter of crap. But when I actually got it on a transport and got it back to the shop and looked at it, it was magical, but the front clip was ugly. Interior was kick ass. The ass was great. The side profile, but the front clip ugly. So I'm like, ah, oh, shit, what have I done? I got another bucket of rust sitting in my yard. My wife's going to be pissed. But uh, shortly thereafter, I went to go pick up a radiator from our radiator shop in the Valley. And he had a same year four-door DeSoto in his parking lot, same color. Okay. And now the DeSoto, plain Jane, ugly interior, ugly ass, profile, boring, nose, kick ass. Hmm. You know, with those killer teeth that, you know, guys used to put them in the 50 Mercs and all the hot rods. So, oh, you know, what are you doing that? He's like, I don't know. I bought that from him. I brought it back. I stayed late that <laughs> same night at the shop because I'm enough of an automotive geek historian that I knew, you know, same parent company, same platform. So the sheet metal is directly interchangeable. No kidding. So I okay. stayed late at night and played Legos and took the DeSoto front clip and bolted it on the Chrysler. I was like, yeah, that's cool. So then I was chewing on what am I going to build? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave the patina. I love, I'm enough of a romantic and into antiques and old shits. So I'm like, I don't want to have to worry about it. I mm -hmm. want to do like balls out mechanical. I'm not going to bother chroming and painting because I don't want to worry about it. I want to take it camping. I want to take it to the beach. And the kids dent it with a skateboard. I don't want to be that asshole dad. 
So it wasn't until that car was finished, I just took it to a car show just because I was going to the car show and it won mm -hmm. an award. Then Hot Rod reached out. It was on the cover of Hot Rod. Then the Art Center gave it an award, like kept winning shit. <laughs> and then customers started saying, I, and I saw that. Is that one of yours? Are you going to build those? I'm like, oh, no, it's just a piece of shit I wanted for myself. And, and again, it just like hit me inside the head. I was like, well, if you really back up, right, it's the same as Icon. It's classic transportation revisited in a modern context, but just skewed another way. So like in Japanese culture, wabi-sabi is the art of natural decay and impermeance and the beauty of that natural evolution and the fact that it's, it's not duplicable. Mm -hmm. And to, they're my favorite, hands down. And the reformers, which are the shiny concourse, pretty hiding all the engineering ones we do, mm -hmm. those were an afterthought because people are like, yeah, I've seen these derelicts, but why on earth would I spend all that money for something that looks like shit? <laughs> I want I want something that's all modern, but I want it to look new. And we're like, okay, uh, we'll call that a reformer and we'll be happy to build it. <laughs> but yeah, it just kind of organically uh, turned into something. And uh, there's so much fun. And the diversity, the crazy eclectic mix of builds that we're doing currently in the derelict line is just so much fun they say the customer's always right but most of the time nah 99.9% .9 of the time they're wrong that shit's for Target yeah <laughs> So when a customer comes to you and says, you know, I want you to do this, and you just wholeheartedly know that it's just not something that you want to build, I'm assuming you're probably going to say no. And if, if it is a no, like, how do you direct that customer into building something that you are going to be proud of? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, it's one of those things where right now I'm blessed to be in a position where I can pick and choose what we're going to build. Life is fickle, right? I mean, things could change. Next year, I could be doing free brake inspections. And so you, you never know, right? So I, I, if I have to eat my words, it'll be sad and I'll change my ways. But right now, on the derelicts, the, 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 the derelicts and reformers serve two purposes. They keep my odd little head from getting... I have brain damage, literally, so I'm going to blame it on that. <laughs> it, 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 it keeps me engaged, passionate, seeking new knowledge, forging new concepts, proving new content, and not just me, my team, right? So it makes us smarter. We're, we're evolving. We're learning. We're trying new things. Mm -hmm. That's imperative. So from that perspective, I won't do two of the same cars. I've done kind of sort of similars in the past, but new rule as of this year. Like someone comes say, hey, man, I saw that 52 derelict style line coupe that you did i want one just like that mm -hmm. nope not gonna do it now i do that both creatively because we don't build that many right i mean we're building maybe four derelicts a year okay so it's very important that everyone we build is 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 the brand it communicates and furthers the brand and, it, and is challenging the brand the other thing is is um and i stole this from my buddy rod emery um those you guys that don't know, Emory Motorsports, 356 Porsche, God, super cool bitch and great style, great artist. And um, I'm not afraid now to say no thank you, um, but here's Galpin's phone number. They, they'd love to build that for you or whatever shop I feel is a good match. And then Rod's, Rod's uh, phrase, and it's actually Emory Dickerson at Singer and myself now, we, we were all commiserating and we were asking ourselves, hey, you know, what do you do if somebody shows up and they say, yeah, I want one of those them their cars, but I want mine purple and I want a pink <laughs> um, hair on fur interior and, <laughs> and I want uh, an orange underglow LED under it, you know, and a fish tank in the back. Yeah, that's, that's a fucking wreck and, right there. And this shit happens <laughs> frequently. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, what we try and communicate with people is, look, they're faster shops. There are cheaper shops, mm -hmm. but this sort of shop is a passion project for us. And part of that means you have to love that we're building this for you. And we have to love building this 
for you. So, I mean, same with like the core ethics questions for my brand when we have new opportunities that seem all shiny and interesting. Mm -hmm. They're like 10 questions that we have to measure those up to. And the answer must simply be, fuck yeah, or hell no. So we tell people, look, you know, if you want all that stuff on, that's fine. It's your car. When we're done, you're welcome to go wherever you want and to add that to it, but we're not going to do it. We're here to build, in our own eyes, arrogant or whatever, highly functional sculptures. And the market understands and appreciates that, and it'll protect your investment long term. Sure. But same, same with you, you um, and this took me more than a decade to realize, you can't, you can't be afraid to fire a customer. Yeah. And the second you do, it's so empowering. First off, karmically, I've only ever had to do that two times. <laughs> Both times, like the second I did it, literally like same day, mm -hmm. a glorious, magical, dear friend of a client with an incredible idea and budget showed up and took that space. Wow. So I think it all goes back to you have to protect your love for it. If your love for it is rooted in the art of it from your perspective, you have to protect it. I would say a good number of watch guys are car guys and car guys are watch guys. So let's talk about the doozy thing because you're a watch collector, but not every person is like you where they have zero reservations and they do whatever the hell they want. So talk to me about the doozy watch and why you chose to do a watch in the first place. At, at age seven or eight, when I was starting to geek on design and sketch stuff, the two things I spent most of my time sketching were cars and watches. Hmm. Did a little bit of architecture in there as well, and I've yet to dive into that. But my son's going to Otis nice. studying architecture, so maybe I'll get to live through him extraneously one day. <laughs> um, both were things I loved since an early, early age. I moved from remote country town in Maryland to mm -hmm. New York City when I was eight. Mm -hmm. I was suddenly immersed in a cacophony of stimulus uh, for someone that loves design, be it the architecture and the streetlights and the, the, the music and the, the food and the antique stores and the electronic stores. And I was actually in Hell's Kitchen where there were a lot of watch shops. Mm -hmm. So I was always hardcore watch dude for sure. Um, it's just that um, cars kind of frankly seemed easier. <laughs> and... Um, and, and just sort of organically grew. And, and I, I found myself over the mostly, I mean, I've always had watches, and but specifically in the last 15 years, I've gotten a wee bit out of control. Um, but, but don't think of me as like, oh, I've got the Daytona with the diamond. I'm so not that guy. Like my watches, basically, if you weren't a watch guy, you wouldn't know. And if you noticed it, it's cause you appreciate design. Like that's cool. But I have watches starting a vintage watches that I bought for 30 bucks that are kick ass right. that I love as much as, you know, a vintage Patek or something. Mm -hmm. And like reference numbers and all that shit. I'm just barely starting to remember those numbers. So again, it was the same appreciation for, for textures and mechanical detail. And then watches to me have become very interesting in the purity of their dysfunction. Meaning the fact that watches still even exist, we can only attribute to the art of the execution. Sure. The, the unnecessariness in, in the details, which has always been my world in my automotive stuff. Mm -hmm. I had this one idea for a watch. It's probably the oldest one I could remember was when I, I got to spend some time around an early Duesenberg and, and I marveled about the really cool tack and Speedo. And even then, I, was in, I loved jump hours. Mm -hmm. At that time, I didn't own any. I don't think I... Well, I could have afforded them because right in the 70s, jump hours were super cheesy and cheap. <laughs> but anyway, and it stuck with me. I'm like, that would be, that speedometer would make a kick-ass watch. Mm -hmm. So years later, um, I have employees who are better at everything I'm good at. So I've stopped welding and crafting and mechanicing and all that. Now I'm doing like product development and I wear a billion hats. But anyway, 
I wanted to learn this new CAD program that I'd heard about. Autodesk reached out to me through my youngest son. We were on an engineering tour and uh, was trying. he was trying to figure out how does he avoid a cubicle and be a mechanical engineer? And he said, Dad, what do I do? And I honestly didn't know the answer. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I put a picture of him when he won a little robotics competition in his suit when he was like probably 12, 13 on my Instagram feed. And I posed the question to this unknown community. Best use of social media ever, man. We got invites <laughs> to National Robotics Lab wow. and JPL and Texas A&M and to Autodesk's Makerspace and all this. So anyway, through that experience, I became friendly with the leadership at Autodesk. I told them, you know, I want to, I used to do AutoCAD. I've hired guys that are better at it. I'm a bit rusty, but I do struggle sometimes. I'd like, as a bit of a control freak in my designs, I'd like to realize my designs at a greater extent before I hand them off to an ME or an EE to, to basically reinterpret and execute. So I said, okay, so whatever, it's a long story, but they ended up sending me a tutor once a week for an indefinite, as long as I needed them. And, and I, I worked with him for about a year and I still need him. But, <laughs> um, and when he came in, he said, all right, what project are we going to do? What do you want to do? Should we do a wheel? Should we do a chassis? And I'm like, you know what? Let's do a watch. Like I've already got rock star dudes doing that stuff. And this is learning and all the micro precision of watches and the complexity and everything. Like let's do a watch. Then it was game on. So, I rattled my brain. I remembered my Duesenberg watch idea. And I had a whole stack of them, but like that's the one that never left me. Mm-hmm. And I had, I had gone to Basel and talked to some of the independent ballers about just making one for me. Sure. And I was like, how much? <laughs> <laughs> so that never happened. And so, so I just started modeling it. And that was the platform with which I would learn this, this new program, Fusion 360. And then I got so obsessed in, you know, in doing that. And again, the mm-hmm. model in my head, keeping me up at night. That's never a good sign, by the way. That's like, <laughs> I'm going to lose my remaining sanity unless I execute when I'm at that stage of anything I'm, I'm visualizing. And, I, and um, yeah, so I, my wife and I run the company together and we started it together. And I, and I went to her and I begged and pleaded. <laughs> and I went to Basel two different times. I went back to Switzerland with, to meet with many different independents. I tried to actually develop the watch here in the States. Mm-hmm. And, um, and yeah, I, I just went for it. I, I just had to create it, just like I had to create the first Icon vehicle. And um, it was so much fun, but incredibly complicated. Incredibly complicated and, and so many curves in the road that I'm a dumbass for thinking that a watch would be easier than a car. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Yeah, especially the supplier network and the politics involved. The politics are the most difficult. Well, Absolutely. I only wanted to make 50. Right. So the company, no one wants to work with you. You're going to make sure. 50. They're like, no. Nah. Unless you're, you know, charging figures that yeah, would I mean, make if you it's fall a, into a Yeah, coma. if it's $400,000, they'll, they'll do 50 and they'll right. charge you still 375. Sure. But uh, the, the one company I'd identified that I really felt was the best partner, second trip to Switzerland, sitting down with them. And, I, and you know, they're talking about design fees. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They're talking about, you know, mechanical engineering and CAD. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, look, no. For better or worse, I have extreme clarity on what I want this design to be. And here are the CAD files for every stupid aspect that I geeked out on because it's my own case, my own crown, my own class, my own. I even made, because I'm a leather craft geek as well, I even made the prototype band and no, no, that's the way I want it. And I want this guy of this angle, this size tile, square holes for the, whatever. Um, so I said, no, I, I understand on the engineering front, you need to package the movement and, and, and realize my rotor and those detail stuff. But, you know, I don't want to deal with all that upfront crap. I, I'm not like a guy who's, come to you with an ego play and I want my name on a watch and we got to go through design studies. So they were okay with that until we got to volume and they're like, yeah, impossible. (laughs) 500 is the minimum. So I was super bummed and resigned to that reality and just going to go walk the halls of uh, Basel world 
mummering with Tourette's talking shit about all the boring <laughs> watches I was seeing that whatever. Of which there are a lot at Basel. Right. And then uh, the owner of the company just literally serendipitously was walking by, sort of glad handing people in the little meeting rooms. And I, we exchange cards and he turns around and he stops and comes back. He goes, your icon, you make the cause. I said, yes. He goes, my best friend has one in Moscow. He just loves it. <laughs> what, what do you want to do? And I told him, and I'm like, yeah, and your soldiers told me to piss off. They want me to do 500 units per skew. And he's like, no, 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 no. We'll make this work. Because I believe in your brand. I believe in your vision. Wow. I think this will grow. Oh, I was so lucky. That's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. Now to my, get anything done in Switzerland, first of all, is incredible. And, and let alone, you know, 50, that is pretty nuts. And yeah. then there's so many hiccups. And I think design is a series of compromises. I hate to make compromises, but you, there are realities of packaging or material or sourcing or development or whatever that involve that. So I found the development of the icon doozy, which is what we're calling this watch, um, to be really rewarding, but fraught with a lot more crap than I ever thought I was going to be dealing with. It was interesting. And I want to make derelict watches. That would be super cool. Yeah. Can you see me sitting down with like Swiss 300-year-old dial companies that pride <laughs> themselves? Like the, the Onyx dial on this watch under a loop. I mean, it's flawless. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. That's not what I want. I want you guys to fuck it up a little bit. Like, <laughs> can we like sprinkle some carbon on it before you put the porcelain in the kiln so it cracks and crazes? They're going to send me packing. My thing is, I'm just trying to keep pushing my luck. Mm -hmm. I love vehicles and have my own vision. So I made my own vehicles. I got lucky. There's enough people that allow it, that I support tons of families and love what I do and, and get to keep doing it. Hopefully forever. I love watches, mostly vintage watches. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to push my luck. I'd like to think... I can keep pushing my luck, hopefully without investors, because that's been one thing that we've been very adverse to. We're, we're debt-free, and it's just mom and pop, and we just stay on the treadmill and uh, just keep reinvesting and reinvesting and reinvesting and try and build out our dreams so we don't have any new chefs in the kitchen or ca you know venture capital that wants me to whore it and flip it, because it just goes against my grain. But man, I'd love to do furniture and architecture. There's so many things that I'm fascinated with in the industrial design world from our past that if revisited in a modern context, it's like, it's endless. There's, there's so many cool things and elements to tweak and evolve that, uh, yeah. Jonathan, I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell people where they can find you and learn more about your brand. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is we just started chatting, right? And people probably don't even know who the hell I am or what Icon is. So Icon4x4.com. I'm a lunatic who builds custom vehicles <laughs> from my own perspective. We're mostly well known for our take on the vintage Toyota Land Cruiser FJ series, the early Ford Broncos, the Chevy Thriftmaster pickups, and then we do a series of one-off vehicles that are electric, gas, or diesel, anything from the 30s to the 60s. We only do what we love. We hope your idea is what we love and you love that we're doing it. And if you're into my new watch, it's on the main website. It's also at iconwatchcompany.com. This episode of the Road Stories podcast was recorded, engineered, and produced by yours truly, Mike Senderovich, with technical and production support by Ken Shu. Original music is supplied by Clarence. You can find Clarence on soundcloud.com forward slash Clarence Los Angeles. If you like what you hear, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Please also follow us on social media at RS Podcast. 